in this tutorial. Um, they come from uh, McGill's Low Back Disorder, but I'm going to be drawing on information from that book. Also from Grey Cook in his movement book, which you, which you can just see behind me here. And also um, Kelly Sturette's uh, book as well. So it's sort of a, an amalgamation of information taken from there and some other um, sources as well. So um, we've got five myths, as I've mentioned. Strengthening muscles of the torso, performing sit-ups, bending from the knees, tight hamstrings, and then training single muscles. The online course and then you've got uh, option number two is how to overcome lower back pain which is the online course and a coaching session as well so it becomes a bit more of a, a rehab package where you get two weeks of support um, you get a, a tailored rehab plan um, and then the use of the online course for the um, for the content to be able to follow um, the plan that, that we've put together for you during the consultation Myth number one is strengthening muscles of the tor torso. So this is a little bit of a, a, a technicality in, in, in some respects, but we are going to be looking at the, um, uh, at the definitions of it. So what we've got here is basically two definitions, one of endurance, one of strength. Strength is sort of the mainstream, um, more commonly understood um, uh, a term, but what is done behind that is more often than not, it's core endurance. So core endurance, um, which is the ability to combat fatigue or a set of muscles to combat fatigue. That's what we're doing with regards to endurance and that's what a lot of core strength uh, exercises are there doing. It's not necessarily core strength, which is essentially the ability to apply force against a maximal load. So there is elements of that within core training. And if you were to do my How to Build Core Strength and Stability program, there are elements of two, um, but they all come under the, 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 the mainstream or the, the commonly held uh, definition of core strength. So when it comes to overcoming lower back pain, that's what we're looking to do is build the endurance of the core muscles. So the ability, ability for them to, uh, to combat fatigue. It's not a case of them trying to be very strong because if you think about a day, there are 24 hours. Let's just say, for example, we sleep for eight. We've got 16 hours left. So that 16 hours, our back has to be, um, uh, or back muscles have to be active and able to cope with, the, with those 16 hours. So that's what we have to think about when we're overcoming lower back pain. What a lot of people do in the gym is they completely fatigue their muscles or their, uh, let's just say their core or back muscles, so they then can't, uh, with the rest of the, the 15 hours that they've got then out of the gym whilst they're awake, they haven't got the, the integrity of the muscles to be able to protect them. So we want to build the endurance, which is the ability to combat fatigue. Myth number two is performing sit-ups. Now, I would call sit-ups an unnecessary exercise, there could be a place for it for the right person at the right time, but if you want to do it, okay, fine, if you are that right person at the right time, but as a general rule, I wouldn't do it for anyone. I wouldn't recommend anyone doing it. There's no real um, um, functional use for them. Um, it's much more advantageous to use other exercises. So one of the reasons, or one of the other reasons, I suppose that was one of them, one of the other reasons is the compression. So the compression, so we, we understand what the sit-up is, it's this exercise here. Compression is this here. So the compression is, as a uh, sort of a, a loose way of describing it, is the muscles are the fist, the spine is the sponge. So when the muscles are activated, it compresses around the spine and essentially is squeezing the spine. So the compression from sit-ups in full flexion, so flexion of the spine here, together with excessive disc annular stresses cause damage to most people doing them. So when we talk about damage, we would be talking, or certainly the, um, the annulus is all the 
um, like the, the the tree circles that go around the gel-like fluid on the inside. So the full flexion and the compression is causing damage to the annulus of the disc, which is then contributing towards herniated, bulging, damaged discs, essentially. It may not end up in a herniated or a, um, a bulging disc, but it will certainly uh, degrade the, the integrity of the disc. Myth number three, bending from the knees. If you go on any manual handling type course, this is something that they will promote. Now, <clears throat> what I should say is this posture is the worst. So having the flexed spine, and we can talk about having a flexed spine and some other aspects towards that. Then you've got the neutral spine with the bent knee. So bending from the knee essentially or lifting from the knees. That would be second best. Then the best would be this type of position. So a much more vertical shin. You've got the hip higher than the knee and you've got the natural curve here. This is dominating the movement from the hip, from the glutes. So lifting from the knees is dependent on different factors. So there could be reason to do it, as you see here, dimension of the load, the lifter, the number of times lifting. So there can be a place for it. But lifting from the knees will eventually wear out your knees because here they're not going through as great um, a range of movement, which isn't going to wear them out as much. If knees come in front of the toes, and I know there are, um, um, well, there is a place for that, that's for sure. But if we're repeatedly doing it, Basically, how, we, how it's understood is if the knee comes forward, there's more pressure on the knee. As the knee goes back, that pressure goes on to the hips. So it's getting that balance right. Hips are much more adept at managing load because they've got the, the joint to do it. They've got the, uh, the muscles to do it as well. And they've got the range of movement to do it as well. Whereas knees are much more effective at uh, not bending as much. Let's just describe it as that. So lifting from the hips is the most effective because of the muscles used. You've also got the more advantageous joint there as well. So if we want to take pressure off the knees or optimize the pressure between the knees and the lower back, it's getting the hips to work correctly. That's essentially what we are trying to do. With regards to a flex spine, because I know there are people out there that seem to enjoy flexing the spine whilst lifting heavy loads. If you are in this position and you haven't got a braced abdominal, then your back is at most risk of um, problems occurring. If you go into this flex position and then lock it into place with, a braced, with braced abdominals, that is more adv advantageous than not having braced abdominals. But it's not as advantageous as being in this neutral range and bracing the abdominals. So if we were to look at the spectrum and the scale of it, there are um, there is a place for these types of lifting, but the most effective way of doing it, um, again, as it mentions here, depending on the, the load, the lifter, or the dimensions, the number of times lifting, so on and so forth, that can um, change. So we have to understand that from the outset. Myth number four, tight hamstrings. Everyone loves to stretch hamstrings. I've done a video I've done a few videos on not stretching your hamstrings in your lower back if you have lower back pain for the main reason, which is the top one here. It's a symptom, not a cause. So as um, back pain gets worse, hamstrings will get tighter. As back pain gets better, hamstrings will get looser. So it's understanding that. It's not the other way around. It's not as hamstrings get tighter, back pain gets worse. If that were the case, then it would be a cause, but it's the other way around. So then we've got asymmetrical hamstrings. Um, asymmetrical hamstrings are more of a problem because there's an asymmetry between left and right, which is putting you at uh, greater risk of um, injury or problems in the future. Internal and external rotation of the hips are a more advantageous way to predict um, 
lower back problems. So in uh, internal external rotation, so imagine you've got someone sat on a desk of some kind. This is their legs coming down. This is their knees. And then they've got the feet here. So if we were to turn this leg up in either direction, so this way would be internal, turning it this way, ooh, external rotation. So that is a more um, uh, advantageous predictor of back problems rather than tight hamstrings. So unequal leg length can have links to lower back pain, but only at extreme differences. Again, um, it's normally more extreme than people think it is. If it's just a, a few centimetres, that's generally seen as not a problem. Um, the other thing with tight hamstrings is, if you can see here, where they originate, this is a very uh, a poor place for stabilising the hips. Now, one of the reasons hamstrings will go tight is because the body is perceiving instability in an area. So what it will do is it will create tightness through here because there's instability through the hips. But as I mentioned, this isn't a very advantageous place to create stability because it's close to the midline. If it was out here, it would be more advantageous. So that is why glute medius, glute minimus, glute max are much more advantageous when it comes to stability. So if we can get the gluteal group working properly, that again will go towards relaxing the hamstrings. Finally, myth number five, training single muscles. What people assume is that if you have, if you train single muscles, i.e. using sit-ups, crunches, side bends, um, back extensions, all these exercises, they assume that if I train all of them individually and get them individually strong, that the whole unit will become strong. This, unfortunately, is a misconception. To have a strong one unit of the torso or of the core, you have to train the core that way. So we have to start training multiple muscles in single exercises. So training the whole core makes the whole core stronger. And by the whole core, I'm talking about the abdominal wall, which is rectus abdominis and the obliques here. Then we've got, you could even include the gluteal group in this, um, which come through here. So glute medius on the sides, glute minimus as well. You could even add lats in there. You've got QL, which is underneath all of this. So we've got to try and include as many of these muscles as possible. What we've also got are three layers to it. So you can see down here, you've got three layers. You've got rectus abdominis here. You've then got internal, external obliques, transverse abdominis in here. So we've got to start training not only these three, these three layers from inside to outside, deep to superficial, we've also got to start training all the way around as well, left, right, back, front, um, as much as we can together, which means using different exercises to sit-ups, crunches, um, side bends and back extensions. Because when I talk about side bends and the QL muscle and stop doing the side bend exercise, it gets a lot of comments, a lot of resistance comes um, the video's way with regards to doing it. It's the same with back extensions. People seem to buy into back extensions because apparent uh, low back experts um, use that as an exercise to um, apparently overcome lower back pain. But I wouldn't have thought that it does it. So those are the five myths uh, of low back pain rehabilitation. Have any questions, do stick them in the comments below. Um, if you are suffering with lower back pain, you need help with it, go to the links below, online course, you can self-coach yourself, or you've got the online course and coaching and the rehab package, which is sitting down with me, putting everything together, having a, having a tailored plan out the back of it, um, with two weeks support as well. So um, many thanks for watching. My name is Chris from Christopher Hall Training. 